Hello. In today's episode, we will be looking at the Parramatta Female Factory, and I have a very special guest with me, Gay Hendrickson. Gay has worked in the museum industry for over 25 years. She has curated an exhibition called Women Transported, Life in Australia's Female Factories, and did a book that accompanied that exhibition. Um, she has worked also as a curator, director and museum educator, and you may recognise her from the popular TV show, Who Do You Think You Are? Welcome, Gay. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. I love what oh. you do with Convict Australia. Ditto. I'm, I'm so excited <laughs> that you're on the show and I love all the, the work you do with the Parramatta Female Factory. You are the guru, the person to go to if you have a question on this. <laughs> and I was just wondering if you could give our listeners just an overview of what is the Parramatta Female Factory? Why were the women sent there? Right. Well, the female factories idea started because they didn't know what to do with the women in the colony and they were basically in tents or in huts. And um, what the government decided to do was develop a, a, a cross between like a, a bridewell and a, uh, a place of conviction and, and a, a work, not quite a workhouse, but it was definitely a factory. So it was a factory for producing linen and wool and Lindsay Woolsey, so sails and blankets, sock clothing for the for the men, um, and it was a way to incarcerate the women. And was it the first female factory in Australia? No, no. the first female factory was a room above the jail at uh, Prince Alfred Square, and it was it did the first functions of the female factory. But the difference is that the current Parramatta female factory that we visit was uh, a specific design of for the women it was to incarcerate it was bringing that idea of female factory there was a uh, discussion between uh, uh, sorry between uh, Elizabeth Fry and Samuel Marsden so it was very specifically designed even the, de the design of it to to bring order to the women <laughs> and uh develop it in that way so I would say the Bridewells from the 1500s right through till uh till the beginning of transportation was the model that they worked on but it was a little bit different here right okay and um do they have a uniform what's there a class system right with this with the second factory there wasn't to start with there was just the you know those who behaved well and those who didn't but controlling the women was always an issue so right from the beginning the, they're working at what can we do there were women escaping there are issues within the factory so what they did they decided to divide into three classes and the first class were well behaved and they were really just the the women who weren't assigned at the docks and then were were um, sent to the factory which used to was usually just people who were pregnant or there was or they just weren't employable in some way but very quickly with the rise of transportation it became shiploads and so they'd come to the first class then the second class was well those who were poorly behaved first class or well behaved third class and the second class was also um, primarily also women who um, who had who had children but weren't married and then you get to the third class which is basically could be anyone who was convicted in the colony. So they might have been a convict woman already, or they might have been a free woman. And they were convicted for usually for more serious crimes. So you could be convicted for, you know, for theft, you know, property was so much more important than people for theft and then, but also for murder, for bodily harm. But also, you know, if you had been uh, sent to the factory too many times, you might be sent to third class. If you're pregnant on assignment, very bad, all your fault, third class. Of course. <laughs> so that's the, that's the class system. <laughs> so could you work your way up? Like if you had committed a serious crime, um, you put in third class, could you through good behaviour work your way up to the first class? Uh, you, I th over time, usually you did, you did your sentence in third class, but if you were really well behaved, it would be pretty much, it'd be similar to the system now in that, you know, reform does have some reward, 
but I don't have evidence of people come, going from third class through. But right. it was theoretically possible. Okay. And what kind of um, jobs were each class given? I take it the third class women were given the the awful jobs and, you know, first yeah. class was given the lighter <laughs> jobs. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, so the main difference is so when you're looking at jobs, um, the first and the second class would spin and they would weave and they would sew, they would wash, they would knit, they would straw plait. So that was all, all three classes would do that. But, but the special women in third class got to also break rocks and pick oakum, which is mm. pulling um, the tar off ship's rope. So that's so that, really bad for your hands, isn't it? It really dries it out and gets oh, all the abs cuts. Absolutely. And, and then also you think pickaxes, the, the, the rocks, the, the stones that say didn't work out and that broke and, should, and weren't able to be used by the male convicts, would then be sent over in smaller amounts to the to the female convicts. And, and I often think if you're walking around the streets of Parramatta, you know, the layer below where there where there was small broken rocks, you know, perhaps that's the women's. Mm. But anyway, that, that's what they did. Yeah. And what happened to the children? Like how young were the women convicts that were going in there first? Like were the child convicts going in there? Was there an age limit like was it adults only or did the girls get sent somewhere else and what happened to the ch their children who weren't convicts but came along okay I'll, I'll do that in two parts the first is um the children generally went with the mother to the factory if they if they were weaned when they were weaned they would be taken away from the mother originally that was when, you know, before the that exponential curve of transportation, because then, then it, it was more lax. But you you really didn't want the women to be subject to what Marsden called the pestilential influence that, that spread throughout the colony. So um, you had to remove the, the children from the corruption. So if the children were older, they would be removed. I mean, I always think of one story where um, there's a woman called Elizabeth Browning Owen and she was coming out on the Morley and she had four children and the eldest was um, supposedly not allowed to go with her because it was too old at age nine. Oh. And she and fortunately, she was on the, the Morley with one of the most humane surgeon superintendents who who even writes about her distress and then um, applies to have that fourth child come with her oh, and the fourth okay. child did so four children come out and then they're all removed when she gets the, to the Parramatta female factory but she marries in 12 months and then she gets she they all reunite but you've got all those kinds of stories so that's sort of part one of your um, question. We don't really know what they did with them. I suppose it's similar. If you think of the spinning and, and weaving that went on in, in Britain, you often see images where they're, or, or read things where the children are around picking up the cotton. Yeah. Or there, there isn't a, a, any sort of description of a nursery for Parramatta. And um, removal of the, the children were, was much better if they could, you know, according to the authorities. And the girls would go to the female orphan school, which if you were lucky and you were in first class, you may get some opportunity to visit them. The, oh, okay. the boys were sent to orphanages at, Param at um, Cabramatta. And if that happened, then um, you weren't going to see your boy until the end of the, the sentence. Oh, so sad. But the youngest, that's the other side of it, the youngest, um, I actually know who, who the youngest were, and that's a whole story in itself. The youngest was um, convicted at age nine with her cousin, who was two years older, and they were in the factory at, at least by the time they were 11. So nine years old was the youngest female convict, and mm. her name... Constance de la Sablonaire and she was a slave girl and she and her her uh, sister or cousin depending on on who's whose mum who's dad <laughs> um the the actual judge said there'd been nothing so viciously proved as this crime which was white powder in the tea of the slave mistress Ooh. 
Oh, so imagine French speaking young girls sent on a ship to another, to a colony, um, um, an African background, so totally different cultures. Yeah. But um, that, they were lucky. That's another, there's, that's another part of the story. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I'm happy to answer it later if it's all of it. <laughs> she so, could have been a Viscountess. Sorry? She could have been a Viscountess. Wow. No, that's a that, that's a, a fabulous story in itself. Yeah. Um, so when they gave birth in the factory, was there like a hospital? There, were there midwives? Yes, there was a fact. There was a factory hospital, and that was open to both the convict women and the free women. So it, you could see it as the first women's health service in the colony. So if you were needing to lay in. Um, you could actually go to that hospital and the children were born there. The, um, they had a head nurse, but a, a lot of the nursing was done by the convict women as well. And, and we talk about the terrible stories of the women, but there was, there was the other side too. You know, if you have a good birth and you have your child there, it, it, it's a wonderful thing. And the sisterhood, you know, the, the women supporting yeah. them. So it's not all really bleak mm. though there are moments <laughs> <laughs> and were they provided with anything like a uniform um no provisions in any way um yes they, they were given slop clothing and you had different what different ones to define the classes um and you had different um parameters as well so first class for instance um, they could have blue surge or uh, like a ticking, if you think of the old mattress ticking, a kind of a ticking, um, oh, yeah. that would be good. You'd have a basic white apron. If you were going to church and you were first class, you were also given a red jacket, <laughs> which is probably the same colour as the uh, maybe the, the military. And you'd have a muslin uh, cap that went under your straw bonnet. Oh, yeah. And if and second class was pretty much the same. Third class, you were basically um, pin tucked. You'd have um, you wouldn't get the you'd have a brown kind of jacket. You'd have the C on your on your shoulder or on on the breast as a you know as a, an applique so that they knew. And also, you'd most likely have um, a a a leather a sheepskin leather apron because you're breaking rocks all oh, right <laughs> so so you would get that you would get you i mean you the uniform was there and and we know it quite clearly through uh some of the macquarie uh documents and he had rules and regulations however you know when when you're looking at the riots there was um one of the problems was that they weren't getting the rations, they weren't getting the shoes. They, they, you know, it records that they didn't have shoes. So depending on the period of the factory and the actual practice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and do they have any downtime? Like, what do they have a day off? Did they, were they forced to go to church on that day, or how did they spend their right. time? Um, Pretty much like the other um, other convicts, theoretically, from eight till three was your working day. So if you produce something after that, you could, you know, you could ostensibly make money, put into your convict bank account. I mean, you wouldn't get the money, would you? <laughs> um, not not at that point. No. Um, so there was there was a working there was a working day. So I think that's well, you'd know better than me, but that, that was I understand was similar to the men. That yeah. you could have a working day with that. Um, the, the later, um, after the first couple of years of the factory, there were Catholic ceremonies in the factory for, for church, and the, then there was the Anglican. So I suppose if you, were, if you were not Anglican and you still had to go to a service, you'd probably go to the Catholics if you didn't want to listen to Mars. <laughs> so, but there's, no, there's not really a record of leisure time that I've come across. Right. doesn't mean it's not there, but there was a work day and what you could do after work. Right. Um, and did they get educated in any way while they were there? Look, there's, there's, there seems to be discussion and attempts, but I haven't found a record of a schoolmistress there. 
Um, but I, I would think that when the Sisters of Charity came, which is in the late 1830s, they certainly were uh, about helping to skill up the women and advocated for them. So I, I would suggest that there was, but we don't have the evidence of it, or I don't have that evidence yet. Right. Um, and what about the staff there? Were they taken from the convicts? Um, who, who was the matron? Um, oh, who who ran the appointed? How was the place run? So there yeah. was a superintendent, and then there were matrons. There were um, then there was sort of like a sub matron um, who were called monitoresses. There was a portress who would be at the the front front of it. Um, the surgeon, the superintendents were basically the administrative bosses, if you like, and the matrons were the ones who actually dealt with the women, controlled the women, gave the punishments. So they were they were really um, they really important in that way. Um, in the first factory, there were no matrons, but um, you know there were there were some interesting uh, superintendents. One was um, George Millmaker, who was one of the unnamed Scottish martyrs, and he was sent out for sedition. But the um, the the government at the time only sent out one master weaver, and he fell overboard. So they had to take a convict who was oh. uh, George Millmaker, who went through um, the High Park barracks and then came out. Um, the last superintendent of the first factory was the first superintendent of the second, and that was um, that was Francis Oakes. And Francis Oakes is known for all kinds of things, including including trying to arrest uh, the MacArthur, John MacArthur, and he was also a businessman, police uh, head of police for a while. He was a businessman, but he was the first superintendent of the second factory. Then you have the matrons. So first matron was matron Falloon, who then remarried and became matron Rain. And um, she features as part of the first female workers action. And probably the best known matron was matron Gordon. Um, she was employed, um, she was Irish, she came out, she was employed for nine years. She became the highest paid uh, female public servant and also got the largest payout because she had a husband who wasn't appropriate and, and that she was retrenched, so to speak. Um, then there were the, probably the other better known is Matron Leach and Matron Leach was sent out with a man called Clapham and they were both sent out by Elizabeth Fry. They were the only Elizabeth Fry appointments and um, didn't get on right from the beginning. He's basically calling her a lush. <laughs> he, he can't stand her, she can't stand him. And we get to discover about the factory because he wrote a 40 page complaint about how the factory was run. Wow. <laughs> it was beautiful. You know, yeah, the women were drinking chocolate with the lawn dress and one woman was reading the, you know, the Sydney Gazette and one was found with her arms around a chimney sweep. So, you know, oh. it's, it's, it's delightful. It's delightful. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's the range of it. And if you're a well-behaved first class, you'd be a monitoress. And also you might go into the, the you know, nursing aspect as well. So there was a range of activities. I remember reading that um, a despised form of punishment there was head shaving um, and I believe they grabbed one of the matrons and maybe did it to her, is that right? Um, I, there, there was, head shaving was a, a huge issue. It, I, I haven't heard them do, they, they did argue with the matron, but I, I haven't heard that head shaving story. But look, let me tell you, stories keep coming up because there's so much still to be researched. But I can certainly tell you head shaving for the third class, were, and it was a form of punishment that just was hated by the women. Yeah. In fact, I remember even back in England, there's a, a, a turn key, female turnkey who says that the women would rather die than have their head shaved. Well, it robs so, them of their femininity and it took so long to grow back. And Yeah, you know, it's their, imagine, their identity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there was, uh, in 1831, there was a situation where the matron couldn't get anyone to shave, have the heads shaved. And uh, in the end, there was one woman who came forward who was, who was one of the, um, one of the, the actual 
convicts and she did it in the end but hated for it that that was one of the riots right (laughs) Mm. um and how could you get out of the female factory Oh, yes, well, do do your time, yeah. <laughs> abscond, <laughs> yeah. um, or, or, um, or get married. So there, there was the marriage, you know, I, I suppose the speed dating version. Or yeah, marriage. so I've There's heard about this. Of- <laughs> I just can't imagine it. Can you explain it in more detail? <laughs> so um, the well-behaved first class, you had to be first class and well-behaved, would go up in, in a line, line up. There'd be an application that would have been made by uh, someone in the colony, um, often often convict men, and they would like to, they you know they'd like to have a wife, so they 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 would look at the lineup, make a few cho- make a choice. The um, two of them would go aside and talk for a couple of hours. Oh, and okay. if it, yes, if it, if it was successful, then um, not not consecutively, but over a three day period, you would have. Um, an agreement. The woman did have to agree, and um, there's one delightful story where a woman didn't agree, and it was in the um, Sis of Charity archives. And the gentleman had brought a bonnet, and he he wanted to you know make a good impression. Gave the bonnet to the woman. She loved the bonnet, but she didn't want the man. So they had an argument while they were the stand. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the the married leaving the factory. Apart from that, is really doing doing your time or being assigned. That's that that was the biggest way that you could leave the factory. But that wasn't really anything to do with your choice. Right. So yeah. an employer would come to the factory and say, "I need a girl who can do this, this, and this," and then they would choose someone. They would select someone and send them on their way. They would apply, and then they would be given the the choice that one. <laughs> right, and that and really it, that's how the whole pop. If you look at that, that that early colony, it was populated by these factory women in exactly that way, because they weren't just assigned, you know, to Sydney. They were assigned to Bathurst or Goulburn or you know, out near Wellington or you know. So it was really, um, it was a big system of of assignment and and really important in that way. And if they didn't get along with their employers for any reason, they were shipped back to the female factory again or were they punished? Or uh, You're absolutely right. They were shipped back to the factory. Um, of course, if you didn't like your master and, and you might not because they, you know, they might have had terrible conditions or well, if you absconded enough or you were lazy, you know, lazy enough, then you would be... Um, sent back to the factory so if you if you played up enough and you didn't want to be with the master that was one way to come back and if you think about it um you could be assigned to someone who is supposed to feed you and supposed to clothe you and doesn't you could be assigned to someone who says i want you but i don't want your child Mm. so um you've got women i mean i always think yes they're incarcerated but they they didn't always see themselves as victims. Some certainly did, but some, you know, some took it into their own hands within the context they had. They found ways, you know, I want to get out of the factory, I get married. I don't like that employer. I'll abscond and abscond, or I just won't do my work. I'll continue to be lazy. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Going back to the, um, the marriage, did they have to do the marriage bans? No. See, Mar- a lot of women in the colony wouldn't, marry you know officially because marriage bans cost money right so if you if you have to if you put up the marriage bans um and women the convict women just didn't have that possibility what they had to do was apply to the governor to get permission to be married every single woman who got married from the factory and actually every single convict woman had to apply to to be married and they could be it could be accepted or rejected and what what are some of the cases like some of the reasons why they would be rejected? Well, maybe they haven't done their time. There, maybe there were no decent character supports, like that little that Constance de la Sablonnier when you know when she arrived, you know that very youngest convict, um, the person that she was assigned to in the first instance supported all through her life, and he he was one of the people who recommended her for for marriage so the governor says you know should this woman 
um, be allowed to marry. Then you get ref basically references from people. And if you get good references, then, then it might be considered. So um, if you get a good reference, no problem. But, you know, you might have been troublesome or unhappy or don't, don't know the right people. So it might be rejected. Or your husband might be a convict that, an Irish convict who's been causing trouble. No, thank you. <laughs> Not that. So the men that came to the factory to marry the women, was the ceremony actually taking place at the factory or near there? Well, usually, well it would usually, of course, Marsden would like you all to be Anglican. <laughs> so, uh, so. Usually the marriage went on at the at St John's, and so if someone is searching for female factory ancestry, you know the St John's um, marriage register is certainly one way they would find out because it usually denotes that they're from the factory. So that that's that's where they would usually get married, but being married, you also become assigned to your partner. So um, if you're assigned to your partner then I, I, I believe you could, that's where you would get the Catholic marriages. For instance, maybe you're marrying a Catholic. It's been accepted. Um, and so you're assigned to your, your husband so you can marry where your husband prefers. Right. And, you know, Marsden and the governors like Macquarie would prefer women to be married than be concubines. Yes. <laughs> Um, do you have a personal connection with the Parramatta Female Factory? Is there anyone in your ancestry that um, came from there? No, none at all. It's just a mad obsession. I did. I do have a female factory woman, but she's from Cascades because there were 13 factories. So you're looking at a whole system. So, um, And that, that was a worse factory, I think, than, than Parramatta. But, um, yes, yeah, so... Uh, I I think I just became obsessive after um, that exhibition and looking at the women's stories and I've always been attracted to to women's stories and and rights of people and and you know these are the women who actually fought for our rights some of them were machine breakers you know so yeah. you're getting um, you know and and I've always been fascinated with um people's choices it's why I love family history too you know why here's this person in this set of circumstances why did they choose that what did they have to deal with in their lives and um it's fascinating and here we have Parramatta female fact you've got over 5,000 stories and it's such a huge part of our history and, and I, I really think you know it should be part of all our um you know history syllabuses we really, we really know more yeah yeah, I'm the so, same. I have no convict ancestry, um, but I just I just find it fascinating, and I love love researching it and hearing all their stories. And it's that thing too, isn't it? That um, you know, I, I love that quote from Aristotle where he says um, that memory is the scribe of the soul, and I think history is sort of the scribe of the community. And so um, I think we are, you know, we are who our ancestors are we stand right here because they've arrived here yeah. and you know we might have free people but they've dealt with the convicts if they were here early enough or the the values I often think the values of these convict women and the convict men had a significant input you know that larrikinism you know yeah. there's a story where 40 women were collecting brush from the factory and they hear there's um races on and they all abscond to the races and one ends up on the back of the horse with the jockey now <laughs> <laughs> you can you can understand um you know the the larrikinism say of the digger if you think you know their grandparent might well have been a factory woman or or you get that sense that the egalitarianism you know i'm not going to judge you by how much money you've got i'm going to judge you by you know how you act in front of me mm -hmm. or i think it's an Australian knee jerk to reject authority on every occasion if we can. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know. So things like that, I, and I often think of the the women as the quiet revolution. You know, like they taught their children, who taught their children, and I think that you know they contribute really to who we are. Definitely. Mm. So when did the Parramatta Female Factory close? Eighteen forty-eight. So it ran it. 
First downlaid in 1818, the women moved in in the 1st of February 1821, so it's 200 years, and then um, it closed in 1848. So even though convictism stopped in New South Wales in 1840, so they stopped sending out, there were still women in the factory. And, and we're talking 1842, you've got 1,200 women and you know, nearly 200 children. So the factory didn't stop just because convictism stopped. I haven't been out to Parramatta to see what remains. Is the entire building still there? Right. Well, this uh, this <laughs> this sort of connects to the idea of it would be great to have world heritage. Um, unlike Tasmania, that where Cascades has what, you know one building and a wall, and and the matrons building there is later. Mm -hmm. The Parramatta Female Factory has more um, original material than any other female convict site in Australia. So it has two Greenway buildings still existing. Yep. That was hospital, matron's quarters, meeting rooms. It has the 1820s uh, third class penitentiary dormitory. So that still exists. Um, the whole of the 1830s Gipps Yard um, courtyard, all those walls still exist. The 1818 wall, south wall still exists. Um, there, there, and and the, uh, there's archaeology happening there at the moment, and it's all it's there's so much still there, and I think that the the site is so important from the point of view also that when I did that exhibition, I found four images only of convict women in that period, two of which were cartoons. I found fifteen objects apart from archaeology that was coming up at the time, fifteen objects that directly related to the women in our total collections. So the whole national um, collections. Um, and so when you look at the site, uh, the story is there. You know, the spaces tell the story. And the archaeology going on at the moment, I was lucky enough to have a, have a peek and they're uncovering the part of the wall that held the gates that the women broke down in the 1827. Oh, so it's so exciting. You know, the, the structures are just under the surface. The buildings, even though the barracks have gone, the original major barracks, when you often see a picture of the, the early factory, you'll see these great barracks with the clock. Now, the barracks were um, dismantled in the 1880s, but all that stone was used for the, the I say the newer building, <laughs> the 1880s building, that is that has that currently has a clock tower. So you're still looking at the original fabric but in a, in a different form. So, and there, there are parts of walls all over the place as well. So it is, it really, it is well intact. And we're saying, you know, this was started 12 months after Hyde Park Barracks, same, same designer. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's very important. Um, so how can we learn more about the Parramatta Female Girls? Well, you can do your own family history research. You can visit my website. <laughs> um, and I've also got a Facebook group that, that you can join. And um, then, there, there, you know, there are organisations that, that do tours and, and um, certainly I take people around as well. But that I think that that um, online things, I, I even with, I love the little bites that come through with your Convict Australia. There's there's things there that that tell the story. So it's out there in lots of different ways. I mean, you can look at the Women Transported book. You can look at my Conviction book. There are people starting to write fictions at the moment that they're doing research. So um, I'm always happy to respond to people if they have a particular inquiry. So yes, that that's it. But it's the stories are within the families, that's the other thing that, you know, start searching at your own female factory ancestors or your own family stories, and you might well be surprised. You know, if your woman has come out here between um, 1804 and, uh, and 1856, then they might've been in one of the factories mm. throughout colonies. You know, there, there were, like I said, there were 13 factories originally. Mm. Yeah, I love your Facebook group. I will leave links to um, your website and the Facebook group and a few other links to help with anyone's research. 
Um, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been so fascinating. I'd love to spend a whole day asking you questions about this. <laughs> I just find it so interesting, particularly my background's the men, as you know. So, yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated by what happened to those women and the children and, you know, how their relationship carried on. And, yeah, it's been fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting linking those those together. So, um, and I look forward to seeing more from the. And I've read your Convict Sydney too. I think that's fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, that's um, the end of today's show. Thank you so much for coming on again. And hopefully, we'll get you on the show again soon. I oh, would love to. I'm happy to come talk about the riot sometime. Excellent. I'd love that. <laughs> it's a pleasure. All right. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>